Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 5th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. Also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discussed two ADN op-eds that, for various reasons, missed the mark on Alaska's fiscal situation. Second, we explain how a recent BBC story badly misunderstands what went on in Alaska's last election cycle. And third, in preparation for the administration's upcoming, quote, fiscal update, close quote, we examine what is going on with oil prices. And now, let's join Michael. Brad Keithley, Alaskans with Sustainable Budgets, uh, is with us here, and he's going to uh, start things off. I was just talking about Scott Kendall's opinion piece. Uh, Brad, you've got uh, you've got some issues. Oh, well, I mean, we've all got issues, but you've got issues <laughs> with uh, some of these opinion pieces in the ADN as well, uh, starting off with the, this uh, piece uh, about Alaska's fiscal, fiscal crisis and a proposed solution by Cliff Grow. So why don't you hit us with that here? We'll get things started. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of, uh, we're going to see a lot of pieces here in the next uh, few weeks in advance of, uh, in advance of the August session as people try to sort of set the field for, uh, set attitudes for what the legislature is going to be doing uh, in August, or if uh, Jeff Landfield's right, uh, moving it off to September. Um, but uh, we're, Cliff Grow's, uh, Scott Kendall's is one of those. Uh, uh, as I as I was saying a moment ago, Scott Kendall, uh, Governor Walker's uh, election uh, uh, campaign manager, right, uh, cu- coming up as, when Walker runs again. Um, Cliff, Do you, you really uh, think you really wait a second? Whoa, whoa, whoa! You really think Walker's going to run again? Oh hell yeah! You think so? <laughs> oh hell yeah! Oh man! I mean, and and, and, and all okay. Scott's doing is plowing the field. I mean, Scott's okay. trying to. Well, that makes a little bit more sense, but I mean, I just think, I mean, did he not see the last turnout? I'm just, I mean, you know, okay, that's good. I'm just, I'm just asking for a friend. That was all. Oh, they've got a rationalization for why the last, the last election went the way it did. Okay. Uh, And, and, you know, and we've got ranked choice voting and we've got a jungle primary and we've got all sorts of things. Sure. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your flow there, but that just kind of floored me for a second. All right. uh, Back to it. Sorry. Cliff. Every, every time you see Scott saying something, that's, that's, that's what's going on. I mean, he's just plowing the field for, for Walker's campaign. Wow. Okay. All right. So Cliff grow. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so. We're going to see a lot of these, uh, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, pieces, opinion pieces, as people uh, try to, you know, set the playing field for for what's going to happen in uh, in August. And Cliff's no different. Cliff is, uh, uh, you know, trying to set the field for for what he feels is a proposed um, uh, what should be the solution that the legislature comes to uh, in August, the final uh, fiscal. Uh, uh, plan that the legislature comes to the, but but he, I want to take his because it's a good example of what I think uh, what I think is is sort of is, is backwards thinking um, he proposes a, a multi uh, 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 pronged approach um, restructuring the PFD uh, uh, taxes of some sort uh, spending cuts of some sort taxes on uh, industry of some sort sort um sort of the same thing that you know a number of people have been talking about including me uh, a multi-pronged approach but here's the difference and here's why why i i get concerned about these 
um, and why I think uh, we're th 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 this piece and others are, are, are going about it backwards. He gives specific numbers for the tax piece. He talks about you know, about $700 million in, uh, in sales or income taxes. He gives a specific number for uh, uh, oil industry taxes, for, you know, uh, increased taxes on the oil industry, 200 to $400 million. He doesn't give a specific number for uh, uh, spending cuts, but at least mentions uh, spending cuts as part of it. But when you get to the PFD, and he puts the PFD first, but when you get to the PFD, what he says is, uh, Alaskans should amend the Alaska Constitution to guarantee a permanent fund at a sustainable level to keep dividends flowing. Sustainable level, amorphous words. And 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 here's here's my point about that. We should fix the PFD first. Right. We should we should set the PFD. Uh, the PFD number should be the the baseline, the template, the 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 stake in the ground from which everything else uh, is, is, is then done, uh, as opposed to saying sustainable level and sort of leaving it to the last and whatever is left over at the end that hasn't been paid for uh, by the other things, well, we'll just, we'll take that out of the PFD as part of the PFD restructuring. Right. The reason, people have different reasons for this. My reason is this, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families. It has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy. That's that's not something we should leave to the end and sort of let it be the fallout of, you know, the what, what we've agreed on these other steps, what we've agreed on taxes and what we've agreed on all taxes. We should minimize, we should minimize the thing that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families uh, and on the Alaska economy. And to me, that means sticking a stake in the ground and saying the PFD is going to be 50-50, POMV 50-50, the governor's uh, proposed uh, resolution of the PMV, of the, of the PFD, sticking a stake in the ground, say that's where we start. And then the other things that have a lower uh, impact, adverse impact on, Alaska, on the Alaska economy and Alaska families, those should be the fallout. Uh, and we should say, okay, well, if we're going to have spending of X, the, PF, the PFD is going to be at, at POMV 5050, then we're going to need to raise Y, and we should raise Y amount, and, and we should raise that amount by using things that have lower adverse impacts. Um, and, you know, and figure out what that is. Is it sales taxes or is it income taxes or the other things? These, these, these proposals that say, you know, it's the same problem I have with Natasha. It's the same problem I have with Kelly Merrick. It's the same problem I have with everybody. These proposals that say the PFD should be the leftover. I mean, we should do it last and it should be whatever, you know, whatever we haven't been able to agree to, uh, on these other things. Uh, we should do it last, and then it should be the leftover of, what, of what's left. Those proposals are are are, are saying we're going to use the thing that has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy. We're going to use that the most, uh, and we're going to set these other things first that have a lower impact uh, on uh, on on the Alaska economy. We're going to set those first, and then let the PFD be the fallout. To me. That's doing things exactly backwards. Right. Uh, and as we look toward August, uh, I think it's important to say for for you know fiscal conservatives and those concerned about Alaska families and the Alaska economy to say no, the PFD is a given. Stake in the ground. The PFD is POMV 5050, uh, and and we're not gonna we're not gonna put Alaska families and uh, the Alaska economy at risk uh, beyond that. Uh, now let's talk about you know the other pieces that need to go in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the equation. The the other thing about that, Michael, is if you do taxes first, uh, everybody's going to say, oh, I can't pay me, I can't pay taxes. We can't we can't you know put that burden on you know the top twenty percent, or we can't put that burden on on whoever we're going to talk about taxes. And so let's minimize taxes, and then you get to the PFD, and the PFD has to take the lion's share. Uh, of the burden because we've already pre-cooked all these numbers on uh, on the other things again right. leaving leaving the burden to the thing that has the largest adverse put it, putting the most burden on the thing that has the largest adverse impact to the Alaska economy and Alaska families so i cliff cliff's good i mean cliff's thought about this stuff cliff has 
you know, is, is trying to be comprehensive about it. But you've got to start with first principles. And first principles is minimizing the adverse impact on the Alaska economy and Alaska families, putting that stake in the ground and then and then working from there. Well, and this has, of course, been part of the problem from the very beginning. The PFD has become the giant beach ball that they bat back and forth across the net. And it has to come off. And as you said, the largest adverse impact. But they've got their talking points. And even though people like... Uh, you know, I think uh, it was uh, Lyman Hoffman and others have have said, uh, you know, I've pointed out that the, the intent was the permanent fund was always the first call. They are going to choose to ignore that because it protects the government spend. And that's what they're really all on about. So, well, well it protects the government spend and it protects the top 20 percent. I mean, I, yeah. it, it, it's sort of hard. You take Scott Kendall. Who's Scott Kendall defending when he, when he attacks the 50-50 PFD? Is he attacking gover- Is he pr- defending government spend, or is he defending the top 20 percent? Right. It, it's probably both. Uh, uh, but but it's it, 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 it they're they're trying to slough they're trying to slough the burden of funding government off on middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, and that's just I mean. We we know we know we've known since 2016 that what what that has the the impact that has on Alaska families and the Alaska economy and it's just it it's it's um just irresponsible to say right. we're gonna we're gonna do that biggest right exactly that's the first run and of course as you said we're gonna see a lot of opinion pieces that come out and say kind of exactly the same thing because they've got their talking points down and and uh we're going to see that so we're going to have to be fighting back against that all right well that's number one we're ready to move on to number two you ready to go yep, uh, sure. uh, all right so now the bbc has weighed in on this and uh they jump into this whole discussion about uh, president biden and uh asking is there bad news for biden in alaska you say this piece, which is kind of an interesting piece, but you basically say they're they're kind of missing the boat on this. Uh, hit me, hit they me are. with a thought. Yeah, they, they are. And the and the and the headline is misleading. I mean, the piece really isn't about Biden at all. The piece is more about uh, bipartisanship in Alaska, and it, and it really gets focused down uh, on uh, on on the the Republicans. The, the so-called bipartisan Republicans that joined with the Democrats and that were uh, that were defeated in the last primary. It's really uh, when, when you think through what this piece is doing and what it's advocating, it's really another one of those Zach Fields uh, uh, pieces uh, that is that is meant to uh, you know promote uh, his brand of bipartisanship, promote uh, uh, those who are. Who agree with uh, with that wing of the Democrat Party, which includes Kathy Giesel, uh, and and sort of tries to denigrate um, uh, the uh, uh, others who uh, uh, who who feel uh, who feel differently. If you look through who's quoted in the article, uh, it's Zach and Giesel and Sarah Rasmussen uh, and uh, and people on that side. There's no quotes from uh, from any of the uh, uh, Republicans that defeated. Uh, the uh, uh, the bipartisan senators um, and uh, and there's no quotes from anybody else uh, in the in the Republican Party. It's a very one-sided piece and smacks a lot of of stuff that uh, that Zach Fields has done in the past. Uh, and so it's really, I mean, the, the, my focus on the piece is not about Biden, not about the headline. That's I think that I think that's sort of I think that was a clickbait uh, a clickbait headline to get people to uh, to click through uh, nationally to to click through and, and read it. It's really the focus on the, the problem I have is the focus on, uh, is the focus on the uh, bipartisan, bipartisan senators. And here's, here's the, here, here's the problem, the, the, the problem I have with it. The, 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 the focus, the focus says that the bipartisan senators, the Republican senators who were defeated in the primary, the Republican legislators who were defeated in the primary, including the house, house uh, members were defeated because they weren't Republican enough. Uh, and so the hard line, I think, it, I think, you know, the reference to Giesel is uh, if, if she was defeated by a hard line Republican. I don't think Roger Holland is, is a hard line. <laughs> I don't think I would classify him as a hard line Republican. They were defeated. These bipartisan senators were defeated not because they weren't Republican enough. They were defeated because they were siding with, in my opinion, siding with the top 20 percent uh, and, and with state government, uh, uh, you know, bigger state government. 
against 80 percent of Alaska families. Right. I mean, they were they were trying to fund government with PFD cuts, and that's the reason uh, they were defeated. You can't find any mention that of that uh, in the article. You can't find any perspective on the on on the positions that were that these people were taking these legislators were taking that led people to vote against them and i and and so i think it's just a it's a biased piece it's an unfortunate piece uh it leaves people with an impression of alaska that i think uh is unfair well it seems to be more anything else this this whole piece seems to be kind of a love letter to the you know to the bigger government crowd to say oh look at how badly these guys were treated and how this fringe element is forcing them out and and uh, you know oh this is why Lisa Murkowski needs to remain in there because she's part of this great group that is willing to work across the aisle and do all these kind of things and really it's it's almost like it's uh, it's almost uh, you know a, a, a kind of criticizing Alaska for how could you guys fall out of your uh, you know, fall out of your tree in this way and do that. I mean, it really is kind of a condescending piece in that way. And like you said, completely unbalanced because it doesn't even it doesn't even touch a base with any of these other players in there to get another feel. So, yeah, but this is kind of the perspective that we're seeing from outside. This is this remind this piece reminds me a lot of a piece. Oh, it's been a few years back uh, that was done nationally, you know, praising Zach Fields coincidentally enough, um, and, and JKT, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, for, you know, recruiting all of these new young Democrats uh, to run against, uh, to run against uh, uh, Republicans and, and, you know, re- imbuing the legislature with these new young, with these new young Democrats. Well, one of them was the guy from, uh, uh, from uh, Bethel, wasn't it, that got, you know, the, the, the representative that, that essentially got uh, uh, run out of town uh, for sexual harassment, like, you know, within six months of the time that he right, showed up right. uh, in the legislature. But it's the same, it's a, it's the same sort of piece that was done at the time that those, oh, those Democrat, younger Democrats were elected that, that praised uh, uh, Zach Fields and JKT for recruiting all this new young vibrant uh, bunch. And that was, I'm not sure it was the BBC, but it was some, some global publication that really said, you know, Alaska's, this new new wave. This 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 article smacks a lot of that, uh, and saying, "Oh, Alaska is trying to be progressive. You know, we're electing these bipartisans, um, uh, and you know, Alaska is trying to move forward, uh, but you know, they're being held back by these Neanderthal Republicans <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that that you know that that are hardcore and just you know because you don't you're not adhering to the party line that uh, that uh, that you're being defeated uh, in primaries. That's not the reason." That's not the reason Kathy Giesel lost. It's not the reason Jennifer Johnson lost. It's not the reason John Coghill lost. The reason they lost is because they sided with the top 20% of Alaskans and they sided with gov- with big government against uh, the Alaska economy and uh, and 80% of Alaska families. you have any comments on this veto error that came around, this $4 billion transfer into the corpus? Um, any thoughts on that? Uh, for And for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there was a Scrivener error. The governor announced uh, in his vetoes, when he announced his vetoes, that he was vetoing the $4 billion that was being transferred from the ERA to the corpus. But when they received the actual document, he had not vetoed that line which again was normally would have been just a clerical error, but the, the legislature is going to make hay out of this, and uh, they say there, there's going to be some question as to whether or not they're going to allow him to correct that. Uh, any thoughts on that, Brent? Oh, it's a it's a giant screw up. I mean, you, I, I think my comment on it at the time was, you know, memo to OMB, you had one job, <laughs> which was to cross out right. the right lines. Right. Um, and you know it. I'm not sure how that how if if it goes to the Alaska Supreme Court and it may I suppose, but if it goes to the Alaska Supreme Court, I'm not sure how it plays out. It should, it should make no difference uh, if uh, if we resolve the fiscal situation in uh, in August and September. It should be that I mean the governor's already said that he wants to push uh, as part of his overall fiscal resolution wants to push the uh, the ERA into the corpus uh, and as part of his constitutional amendment and and protect uh, the ER the ERA so it should 
uh, make no difference. We should get to, you know, if we got to a fiscal resolution that incorporated uh, the governor's ideas and other others ideas and got to a final resolution, that resolution should incorporate pushing the ERA uh, into the protected uh, uh, corpus as well. And so this where the $4 billion is um, uh, should make no difference. Um, you know, it will it will be an issue in August or September. Uh, it, it will be used as leverage by uh, those who want to push back on the governor's proposals um, and say, look, your $4 billion is already off the table. You know, we're just going to take that as a given and you can't use it as part of uh, as part of this resolution. The governor will say, no, it was a Scribner's error. If if we don't resolve it in August and September, it may well go to the Supreme Court. I mean, basically what happens is the permanent fund corporation uh, is is on the hook. Uh, they're the ones who do the accounting on this 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 money, uh, and they will either you know slide it into the protected corpus, uh, uh, buying into the legislative argument, or they will keep it in the RA buying the governor's argument, and one side or the other will sue them to to you know say that you handled you handled the disposition of it wrong. I it, it's a screw up. Shouldn't have happened. Uh, uh, stupid on somebody's part. Uh, to not double check, uh, you know, the final document that was uh, that was being filed, um, shouldn't it shouldn't make a difference in the long run if we get to a, a, a permanent fiscal plan. Uh, if we don't, uh, and this stays uh, stays out there, may end up uh, going to the courts. Well, and the bottom line is is that there's still what nearly eighteen nineteen billion dollars in the ERA even after the transfer. So, I mean, the, there's still money available if it needs to be taken for whatever reason the governor is trying to think. So I think that this might be much ado about nothing in the long run because, again, and as you say, whatever's left over in there needs to, you know, has to be transferred into the corpus if the governor's plan is to succeed anyway. So really it might be much ado about nothing. Yeah, it's a it's a great talking point for, for you know, Scott Kendall and others who uh, – um, who you know want to ding the governor for you know his uh, his his uh, the issues that the administration has had uh, over time? It's another one of those issues. Stupid things shouldn't have happened. Um, it's like a Three Stooges moment. It's like you know who's running what from where kind of thing. You know who's in charge, and I mean it doesn't. You know, I've, it I've, doesn't I've look run good. Documents, be- I've run documents before in 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 closings and other things, and you can, you know, once in a while you see something like that. Uh, but boy, you know the person who does it, <laughs> they they they've got a hole they need to dig themselves out of. Right. They had one job, which was to make sure it was done right. 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 You are so fired at this point, is what they're saying. <laughs> I mean, you are so fired. Well, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to uh, to see how that plays out. But again, uh, with there's still plenty of money in there, and like you said, with uh, if the, if the fifty fifty plan and the SGR six plan gets any kind of hearing or any kind of play on this, it all has to be transferred in anyway. So this is just a precursor to that. Look at this; we made it all the way to number three here. We don't normally do that. We normally get a little long winded, but. Uh, uh, I thought it was important to get to number three, and we've pretty exhausted the, uh, the the points on one and two. So let's dive into it. The Dunleavy administration keeps mentioning about how oil prices are rebounding, which they are. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And oil prices could reach up into some highs, uh, you know, maybe low hundreds if that's the case. But it may not be the the savior that everybody seems to think it is. Uh, Brad, uh, dive into this for us. So, yeah, oil prices are up, but it's entirely artificial. I mean, what, what is driving oil prices now is is OPEC, which is about 25% of the world's uh, oil supply, is holding uh, about 6 million barrels a day uh, off the market um, and by, through, uh, through production cuts. Um, and, and so what you're seeing is a tightening supply demand uh, as demand recovers uh, uh, due to you know COVID uh, uh, economic activity related to COVID coming back uh, that was depressed due to COVID coming back as demand recovers uh, you see a tightening market uh, but it's entirely because uh, uh, OPEC has been holding uh, holding the supply uh, off the market over the weekend uh, OPEC uh, had a meeting to uh, address uh, uh, relaxing. 
uh, bringing some of that production back. It was uh, anticipated that they would do that. Uh, there is now a problem between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia on the one hand and the UAE, uh, which has about uh, three, four million barrels a day of productive capacity. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem between them about uh, UAE, UAE's allocation share. That resulted in the OPEC meeting over the weekend uh, uh, falling apart. Uh, the, the additional production that most anticipated coming out of that meeting slight increase in production that most anticipated coming out of that meeting not being approved and so it's saudi's position at least right now that uh, uh that the the constraints the artificial constraints that that they've had in the past stay and that there's no increased supply coming out of opec uh, uh this fall to uh, to meet uh, to meet rising demand and that's and and some anticipated that's going to that's going to drive uh, near term oil prices uh, even higher uh, but but it's all being driven artificially. It's all being driven by uh, OPEC at the moment. And and one of the consequences of of this of this standoff between the UAE between Saudi and Russia on the one hand and the UAE on the other uh, may be that OPEC sort of falls apart again. We saw that in early uh, 2020 before uh, the pandemic started. Right before the pandemic started, when there was a price war between Russia and Saudi that drove oil prices down, as we all remember drove WTI at least uh, below zero and drove uh, uh, general uh, oil prices and Brent prices down into the down into 30. So that's one potential consequence because the oil is there. Right. The oil, the oil is there. It's just not it's just not uh, uh, the productive capacity is there. It's just not being uh, used because of the artificial constraint. So, yes, we have a near term increase in oil prices driven by uh, the artificiality of OPEC holding supplies off the market, but the question is, is that is that going to is that going to continue? Because you know when we talk about fiscal plans and we talk about relying on higher oil prices as part of that fiscal plan, which I anticipate we're going to hear from the Dunleavy administration, the question is, are those oil prices are those oil prices going to persist? And the best indicator of that is to go to uh, what the futures market are is saying about uh, oil prices when you when you when you when you cut through all this you know you can have predictions out of all sorts of agencies but the real question is where are put it, people with money putting their money uh, on uh, on what oil prices are are going every friday we chart as part of our regular uh series uh what the future market futures markets are saying about oil prices uh and on that chart we have uh, we're clearly showing that uh, current prices are above uh, where uh, the Department of Revenue had projected them by a substantial amount. We're in the 70s, and, and DOR had projected that we'd be in the 60s. But once you clear out of out of out of the out of this year and a little bit of overhang into next year, the futures market are, is telling you oil prices are coming back down. Uh, in fact, they're saying by uh, 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 fiscal year 2025, 20, uh, uh, we're back at, well, by fiscal year 24, we're back down to $64. Fiscal year 25 is $61. Fiscal year 26 is $60. And then, uh, and then on out, it's, uh, it's $59. That's what the, that's what the futures market is telling you. At the same time, DOR, the DOR projection is for prices uh, to continue to ramp up. And by the time you get to fiscal year 29, there's an $11 spread between what the futures market is telling you the price is going to be, and what and what DOR's projections uh, have been. So, the, we, we you don't set fiscal policy. You don't set fiscal policy on what the price is today. You set fiscal policy on what the price is for the foreseeable future, the period that you're trying to set fiscal policy for. As 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 Wayne Gretzky said about uh, about hockey, you don't skate to where the puck is. You you skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, and 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 you set fiscal policy based on where prices are going to be. So those who are going to you know who are going to be arguing again, this is all about August or September, whenever we have that, whenever we have this come to Jesus session. Those who are arguing that oil prices are up and so we don't need to worry about this and and everything is is going to be hunky dory. We've been saved again by the artificiality of OPEC. 
um, uh, they need they need to be looking at, looking at where the puck is going to be, and where the puck is going to be is not these high prices that we're uh, that we're seeing. At least the market's telling us is not the high prices that uh, that we're seeing currently. And so we need to be setting fiscal policy based upon where those where the market's telling us the prices are going to head uh, over the over the the span of the of the next several years, uh, as opposed to just today's uh, 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 artificial market created by uh, by uh, by OPEC. Um, you know, and in all fairness, I mean, futures markets have been wrong, but are they the best indicator overall? I mean, do they have the best track record overall based on, uh, you know, uh, past uh, performance? Well, you're absolutely, yeah, I mean, futures market, markets are going to be absolutely wrong, but but you've really not, you, you've not got anything, you've not got anything better. I mean, DOR just sort of sticks its finger in the air and says, ah, they're going to go this direction. EIA sort of sticks its finger in the air. And it's frankly stopped sticking its finger in the air because it's because it's it's uncertain. So, so if you're if you're a fiscal conservative, you believe in doing things conservatively, right? You believe in doing things based upon the best the best indicator you've got uh, at the time. And the futures market again is where people is pu are putting their money, where people you know where they put their money where their mouth is, or put their mouth where their money is, one or the other. Uh, those are the best indicators you've got. Uh, of, uh, of of what's going forward, and if, if you're a fiscal conservative, you're saying, okay, we got to be conservative on this. We can't we can't you know bet on pie in the sky, and and the and the futures market people where people's putting money uh, is saying, look, you know prices are 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 gonna are gonna head back down after we get through this artificially driven period of of sharp recovery from COVID right. and uh, and OPEC holding supply off the market. This goes back to this is something that the legislature has continued to. I mean, I think do poorly for years and and the governor's office. I mean, I still am remembering the Sean Parnell days of factoring a budget based on $115 a barrel oil when it was in the low 70s. And um, we've just done a horrific job of trying to project uh, oil prices. And it's one of the main reasons why I've advocated, and it's why number four on the Charter of Changes is to change the way that we budget, because it just doesn't seem to try and make sense to predict what's going on. Because, I mean, even the future markets can be wrong. I mean, so we, we just sure. don't even know. I mean, we should be basing this based on, um, I mean, like I've said, I think we should be basing our budgeting process based on the average of the last five years of revenue, just just to make it safe instead of this pie in the sky. Oh, we think it's going to go here. It could be there or it could be lower or it could be higher. And, and I just think it's ridiculous that that's, you know, this is kind of the game that we end up playing in this state year after year. It is, Michael. But but here's and here's an even uh, uh, another factor, I think, that's important to consider about where we are now. These prices are not being driven by pure supply and demand. They're being driven by artificial supply and demand created by Saudi keeping by by OPEC keeping supply off the market. The the part of the part of the problem between the UAE and Saudi right now is the UAE is looking at the future and saying, look, oil demand is going to start is start going down. Uh, not you know not something they want. But they're being realistic about the fact that oil demand is going to be uh, in decline in the future. And they're saying, look, we've got this resource, oil, that we can monetize now, or if we keep holding it back, uh, we, we're going to end up with stranded assets. We're going to be part of the stranded assets gang. So we want to push, we want to push our monetization forward uh, to, get, uh, to get the supply out while it's still – to get the production out while it's still, while it's still valuable. And that sort of – that sort of thinking is is not just in the UAE; it's elsewhere uh, in the in the world as well. And I think it I think it's silly as a result of that to sort of depend on this artificial market created by OPEC holding supplies off the market, this artificial price created by OPEC holding supplies off the market, as 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 a as a future as a future indicator. That's what that's what's driving these futures markets prices down. They're seeing the same thing. They're saying, look, it doesn't make sense for these countries to be holding this supply off the market long term. They're going to they're going to they're going to turn around. They're going to want to monetize the supply, put that supply on the market. That's going to drive uh, that's going to drive price down. So for us to be, you know, for us to be using current prices not only doesn't make sense from the standpoint of the futures market, it doesn't make sense from the standpoint of the forces that are at work uh, in the in the oil market currently, and and what the likely outcome of those forces are uh, are over time. So yeah, it's it, we shouldn't be budgeting. 
we shouldn't be budgeting on current prices and expecting those to continue or as, as some are you know claiming uh, uh, going up that just makes no sense uh, in terms of uh, in terms of long term setting a long term uh, fiscal policy for the state. Well, and this is a uniquely Alaskan problem because you know we seem to continue to do this. You know, most most uh, states have a have a stable tax base of some kind, so they kind of can predict and project what they're going to receive. You know, plus or minus a few percentage points, and they can get it. We are the ones that are kind of throwing the mud at the wall and seeing what sticks, or throwing the dartboard at the wall and seeing what sticks. And it seems like there's a contingent in the legislature uh, that is always like, oh, they're just crossing their fingers and hoping for the next spike in oil that will drag them out of this morass or out of this problem that they've the hole that they've dug for themselves hoping that oil will come back up so they don't have to face it again and and i think that's part of the problem it is and and the governor is going to be i I anticipate we're going to hear you know in the next couple of weeks the governor coming up with new revenue forecasts he's already said he's going to come up with with updated fiscals uh coming up with new revenue forecasts they're going to have you know take current oil prices, project them out, probably have a, a rising uh, price level to them and say, hey, we're solved. You know, we, we've got oil has solved us again. We do remember the governor's 2018 campaign, right? I mean, he did the same thing. He said, oil is going to be $80. We don't have to worry about this. We can pay, you know, full PFD. We can pay back PFDs. No problem. Don't worry about it. Then we got, then he got elected and all of a sudden oil prices were, you know, $50, $60, $40. Uh, and 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 we had a big problem. There's there's a history here with how this governor's viewed uh, oil prices. So my my point is that don't don't buy into it. Don't buy into these claims that that the oil prices now are reflective of what we're going to have uh, in the future, right. and we can set fiscal policy based on that. So I mean, it basically boils down to as OPEC uh, giveth, so can OPEC taketh away, right? I mean, because they can again, it's it's there is a demand, and the artificial component that you're talking about is based on the fact that you've got this entity that's regulating the throttle on the production, so that they can say up or down, and to whatever benefits them the most, and it could go up and down based just on what they want to do. So that's the artificial component we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And there's another component of this. I mean, uh, shale, U.S. shale has really been fairly silent uh, uh, during this recent uh, price rise because they don't believe this price rise is real long term. They don't want to make investments based upon based upon an expectation that prices are going to stay at this level um, uh, and then find prices to, 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 to drive down. But if shale clicks over and says, OK, well, maybe these prices are high. <laughs> maybe these prices are going to be sustainable. Then shale comes back. Right. You know, people start investing in shale. We start having, you know, and that's a fairly quick, quick cycle turnaround. Shale production comes on, and then we drive the price down because of that. So, right. one way or another, price believing that the current price levels are going to stay in place is just a fool's game. All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Interesting discussion. I appreciate you uh, being part of it, and we look forward to talking with you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keith, Lake, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.